It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. But first, I want to thank the over 150,000 nurses in Ontario as they celebrate Nursing Week 2016. And I believe that all registered nurses, nurse practitioners, registered practical nurses and nursing students deserve our praise each and every day. And I will stand with the nursing profession as they have faced unprecedented cuts by this government. Everywhere I travel, Mr. Speaker, in the Order. Province, I hear about nursing cuts. In Timmins, dozens of jobs cut. At Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga, 15 RNs just cut. At Runnymede Health Centre in Toronto, half the RNs have been cut. This is just a small fraction of the 1,400 nurses fired in the last year. And Mr. Speaker, I'm not interested in a history lesson question. of what the government did 15 years ago or 50 years ago. My question is, why have you fired 1,400 nurses Thank in you. the last year? <clears throat> There's an indication that things are going to ramp up, and I will bring it down. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I certainly understand why the Leader of the Opposition wouldn't want to talk about the past. He wouldn't want to talk about, uh, about the record of that party when they were in office, nor would he want to talk about the nine years that he spent in, uh, in the Stephen Harper government when the health accord was cut, Mr. Speaker. So I understand why he doesn't want to talk about that. So let's talk about the facts, Mr. Speaker. Let's talk about the facts that since 2003, more than 26,000 nurses, yeah, including yeah. 11,000 registered nurses, have begun work in Ontario. Let's talk about the fact, Mr. Speaker, that year over year we have increased health care funding, including this year, Mr. Speaker, a billion dollars, of which $345 million, Mr. Speaker, is for hospitals. So there is a, a consistent trend line, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in uh, 2015, the number of nurses employed in nursing in Ontario increased for the 11th Answer. consecutive year. Those are the facts, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Last week at a town hall meeting in Sault Ste. Marie, residents and frontline workers shared with the Sioux Star the horror stories of the Liberal cuts. Glenda Hubley, president of the Ontario Nurses Association Local 46, apologized on behalf of all frontline employees. Despite the fact that they do their best amid extreme pressures under their work, sometimes they can't do it alone. But this government is forcing them to do it alone. Our frontline workers deserve better. Our patients deserve better. Mr. Speaker, again to the Deputy people, House Leader. why did you let go 1,400 nurses last year? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I know that the people of Sault Ste. Marie are very happy with their new hospital and all the yeah. services that it's providing. And I know they're happy with their nurse practitioner-led clinic and the family health teams as well that are yeah. providing excellent care due to the excellent work of those frontline health care workers. But, Mr. Speaker, it is simply not true that we're cutting the number of nurses uh, in any sector, because when you look at just the hospital sector alone, between 2011 and 2015, the net increase, because I know the both opposition parties like to talk about the gross, just the layoffs and not the new hires, but when you look at the net change between 2011 to 2015, just nurses in our hospital sector yes, increased sir. by 7,625 oh. positions. The majority of them are. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. I, uh, Final supplementary, please. Mr. Speaker, again uh, to the Premier, 
Uh, sometimes I wonder what fantasy world this government lives in. You've got the Minister of Finance saying hydro rates are going down, and you have the Minister of Health saying he isn't cutting nurses, despite the fact 1,400 were fired last year—1,400 that we desperately needed. So let me point out another example, Mr. Speaker, in Simcoe County. At Soldiers Memorial, 16 beds just cut, 35 people fired. The numbers don't lie. The hospital cuts we're seeing in every hospital in Ontario do not lie. Mr. Speaker, the people of Simcoe County deserve better. The residents of Rama First Nation served by Sergio's Soldiers Memorial deserve better. Will the Liberals reverse the cuts at Soldiers Memorial? Will they do the right thing and support our nurses? Question. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, in fact, the changes that have been made at North Simcoe, uh, rather at, uh, at Aurelia Soldiers Hospital, Mr. Speaker, were the result of a uh, recommendation coming from the Lynn, but also from a provincial rehabilitation association that looks at complex continuing care. And it looks at how they can actually bring those services and those supports closer to people in their communities. And the decision, this one aspect of the decision at Soldiers Hospital, in fact, was a result of the Provincial Rehabilitative Care Alliance and the Lynn and the hospital itself realizing that they could actually shift support closer to the the communities where that complex continuing care is made. That's what's happening. It's actually an improvement in the services that Ontarians can expect. It's unfortunate that, unlike Answer. almost all of his colleagues in the PC party, I wish the leader of the official opposition would actually come to me if he's Thank got you. concerns about hospitals across the province. Thank you. New question, the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Since I can't get an answer on the 1,400 nursing cuts, I'll try something else. I want to read to you a sub-headline from an editor. Stop the clock. Come to order. Please. Mr. Speaker, I want to read you a sub-headline from an editorial in the Toronto Star this past weekend. It read, The government wants to reduce waitlist times for intensive treatment for autism. Unfortunately, it is doing this by simply cutting kids on the waitlist who are over five. That's not fair. This government's idea of helping children with autism is taking them from one waitlist and just putting them on another. Mr. Speaker, it's not too late for this government to reverse course and do the right thing. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier listen to the fine folks of the Toronto Star on their recommendation and fund autism for families Question. that need it? Fund IBI. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And they are fine folks at the Toronto Star, as all our all our media gallery. But, Mr. Speaker, I will say that on this, it's uh, it's very important that we understand exactly what is happening, and that is that there are children who have been sitting on a waiting list, not getting service, Mr. Speaker. And that the status quo is unacceptable. It is unacceptable to us Order. on this side of the house that children who need therapy in a in a, a window of time, Mr. Speaker, as they develop, that they not get that therapy. So, Mr. Speaker, we are we are investing in the system so that those children will get the service that they need. We are working with the families. The service providers are working with the families. The education system is working with the Ministry of Children and Youth Services because we know, Mr. Speaker, that helping those children through the transition, making sure they get Answer. the intensive service when they need it, and then that they are able to be socialized in school, that is what that is what children need, Mr. Speaker, and it's up to us to make sure we get them off a waiting list and into that transition, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. And the Premier is not going to listen to the editorial of the Toronto Star. Maybe the Premier will listen to Michael Barrett, president of the Ontario Public School Board Association. And he said, I quote, it's never too late to correct a mistake. And cutting IBI treatment for children over five is a mistake. It is a mistake to take the chance for IBI treatment away from a five-year-old like Keith in Toronto. His mom called these changes devastating to her child's future. And she said these devastating cuts to Keith's treatments are heartbreaking. Mr. Speaker, why is 
this premier? Why is this government taking away IBI from children that desperately need it? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I just said, what we are doing is we are uh, working to ensure that 16,000 more children get service, Mr. Speaker, that the service that the children get uh, is tailored to their needs, Mr. Speaker, that they move off the waiting list, that they have the opportunity to immediately start to, uh, to buy services, Mr. Speaker, and that they make a transition into new service that is tailored to their needs based on a clinical assessment, Mr. Speaker. That is of much more benefit of Order. much more benefit to a child than sitting on a waiting list. And quite frankly, I don't understand why either of the opposition parties would want to see children languish on a waiting list, getting no service when they know perfectly well that kids need service early and they need it continuously, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Order. Leader, the third party come to order, please. Final supplementary. Mr. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. I'll go back to this Toronto Star editorial that I mentioned earlier. To quote the Toronto Star, to suddenly strip children and families of the hope to which they have clung, sometimes for years, is too cruel a way to save money or find efficiencies. Too cruel. Mr. Speaker, that is exactly what this move by the government is. The Toronto Star is right when they say it is cruel. Thousands of families waited for years. Then, with a stroke of a pen, this government ripped any ounce of hope that these families had away. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier put herself in the shoes of these families that you have kicked off the list? Will you give them the hope they need, the hope they deserve? Mr. Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing? It's not too late. Will you fund IBI for kids over five? Autism doesn't end at five. Thank you. Premier. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. So, one thing we can agree on, I think, here is we do want to give hope to those children. We want to give hope to families. And it's important to note that we are not taking kids uh, away from service who are on that wait list. We're putting them into service, Speaker, and our service providers will work very closely with those families. In terms of education, the Minister of Education and I and our staffs are working together. And I read the Michael Barrett article. I know him personally. I know the Minister of Education does. We're reaching out to him to make sure he has all the facts and the information about how we're going to continue to give hope to these kids, how we're going to not accept that they're on wait lists for potentially up to five years by 2018. I think nobody wants to see that. So it's very important we work with our education partners because many of the Answer. speakers are are school age or will be coming school age very shortly, and we want to support them Thank through that you. transition. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. When families are at their most vulnerable, they count on a nurse to be there. But for the last 16 months, nurses have been fired at a rate of 90 a month. That's three per day, Speaker. That is unacceptable. Will this Premier make a clear commitment? No more. Registered nurses will get a pink slip. No more registered practical nurses will get a pink slip. And no more nurse practitioners in this province will get a pink slip. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I refer to the, uh, the answer that uh, I have already given in, in, and re repeat that, Mr. Speaker, we have year over year increased Member the from Prince Edward Hastings system. come we to order. Increased the amount of money that uh, that goes into uh, into health care Mr. Speaker and the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has made it clear that between 2011 and 2015 over 7000 nurses Mr. Speaker have been hired and placed in this province. The fact is Mr. Speaker that if you look at the changes that are being made in the system it's true there are services that are moving out of hospitals into the community Mr. Speaker or uh, in some cases moving closer to uh, uh, communities, Mr. Speaker, and that means changes. That means that means changes in personnel. It means changes in location. But it doesn't mean fewer health care providers, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, it means more health care providers as we increase service across the province. Thank you. Supplementary. 
on, uh, on Friday, the Premier was touring an Ottawa hospital, but on the other side of the city, in another Ottawa hospital, nurses were given notice of more layoffs. Queensway Carleton Hospital told staff that five full-time and one part-time nurse from the childbirth program would be laid off, and a full-time team leader in surgery would also be eliminated. Fewer nurses means less care and longer wait times for the people of Ottawa, Speaker. And make no mistake, this Premier is directly responsible. Cutting nurses is the wrong thing to do. Patients know it, families know it, New Democrats know it, nurses know it. On Nursing Week, how can this Premier defend another round of Liberal cuts to frontline nurses in Ottawa? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Sure, well, Mr. Speaker, I wish we could at least agree on one thing, that we choose an independent source for the statistics that we provide in this legislation, that we don't talk about gross uh, numbers or layoffs without talking about the new positions added. And I would hope that we could agree, and it's transparent for all Ontarians to see, the College of Nurses of Ontario, that they publish on an annual basis the statistics for nurses in this province. And well, if you don't want to believe the College of Nurses of Ontario, that's your choice. But they've indicated that in the last year alone, almost 3,000 new nursing positions in this province, not new. But they've, they've published in the last five years almost 8,000 net new positions Answer. in our hospitals, the majority of them RNs. I would choose to believe the college on these. I would implore the opposition parties to do Thank the same. Thank you. Yeah. Final supplementary. Speaker, since 2012, the Liberals have taken $100 million out of the Ottawa hospital's budget. That's a fact. Forcing that hospital to cut frontline health care workers year after year. That too is a fact, Speaker. Over at CHIO, another 27 full time positions had to be cut last year. Another fact, Speaker. And now on Friday, the health minister admitted that this year's funding for Ottawa's hospitals, like Hôpital Montfort will not keep up with inflation and population growth. Another fact, Speaker. It will not repair the damage. It will not stop the cuts to nursing. In fact, it means another year of cuts to health care in Ottawa. Why won't this Premier do the right thing, Speaker, and put a stop to any more nursing cuts in Ontario's hospitals? Well, Mr. Speaker, it is true that on Friday the Premier and I was honoured to be with the at Montfort Hospital. We announced new funding and increase of $19 million for the Ottawa hospitals, Mr. Speaker. And it is, and it is also a fact that by any indicator, according to the College of Nurses of Ontario, we have more RNs working in this province than since we came into office. We have more RPNs. We have more nurse practitioners. Every, whether it's per capita or absolute numbers, it's increased, Mr. Speaker. And I can't help. But I have, history is an important lesson, and when you have an opposition, a third party, that 3,000 RNs lost their jobs when they were in power, when they cut funding in the last year of their, uh, of their time in government, cut funding to hospitals, when they closed 24 percent of the acute hospital beds in this province, I'm not going to take my lessons from a party with that kind of record. Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Start the clock. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Last Friday, I was in Sarnia. I met an elderly couple who moved to Sarnia because the health care in their hometown of Wallaceburg had, forced, had faced so many cuts that they wanted to live in a place where they thought they could be sure that they would be able to actually age with dignity. Speaker. Now that they're in Sarnia, the hospital is being forced to cut $5 million from its budget, and the total number of hospital workers cut over the past four years will reach 80. Wow. And the hospital will still face a $1.7 million shortfall. This elderly couple thought that they could find security by moving. People can't get away from the cuts, though, Speaker. Will this Premier do the right thing and ensure that hospitals are not being forced to cut? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
to serve health and long-term care. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, we're increasing our funding to hospitals across this province by $345 million this year, and that represents a 2.1 per cent increase in the line in the budget for our hospital funding. And it includes Blue Water Health in Sarnia. That, in fact, Blue Water is doing better than the provincial average because they're receiving an additional $3.5 million this year, an increase in their operating budget, and that represents a 2.73 per cent increase in their operating budget. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the facts are we continue to invest in our health care system an additional billion dollars this year, $345 million of that going into the operating expenses of hospitals, a 2 percent increase. Answer. And that doesn't even begin to talk about the enormous capital investments that we're making across the province. Thank you. Speaker, Sarnia isn't just cutting another 11 jobs. They're not just facing another $5 million in cuts. The complex continuing care unit is being forced to close eight beds. To the Premier and her minister uh, and the governing Liberals, this may be all about spin, Speaker, but to the people, uh, it's about health, and it's about the health care of their families and availability of services in their communities, in their community hospitals. Will this Premier actually face up to the silent crisis that the Liberals are creating in the health care system and put a stop to the hospital cuts right here and right now. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, we, as I mentioned, we continue to invest, and I, I want to talk about the capital investments that were outlined in our budget recently passed, because we're over the next decade, we're investing $12 billion in hospitals, in renovations, in expansions, and in many cases, brand new hospitals Sorry, right across this hospital. province. I mean, Mr. Speaker, it's an important investment, but we also recognize that hospitals have ongoing maintenance costs and small redevelopment and renovation costs and so we've increased by 50 million dollars each year in this year's budget the funds that we put towards those renovations but at the end of the day mr. speaker we expect our local hospital administrations and their boards together with our lens together with the ministry to make decisions which ensure that the quality of services and care and are of the best possible quality that's our goal and we we work hard to achieve that across this province mr. speaker yeah. thank you Final well, Speaker, those hospitals are going to have a hard time serving patients when there aren't any nurses at the bedside. For the last three years, per capita health spending on hospitals in Ontario has fallen. The last time that happened, Speaker, was in 1997, and Mike Harris was the Premier. And today, just like in 1997, hospitals are being forced to close beds, fire nurses, cancel surgeries, and treat people in conference rooms and in hallways. That's what's happening here in the province of Ontario. Treatment in conference rooms and in hallways because of liberal cuts to our hospital system. When will this Premier stop cutting hospitals, stop firing nurses, and make sure Ontarians can count on our hospitals and our health care system. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, finally, Mr. Speaker, something we can agree on, the fact that the PC party, when they were in power, yeah. there were 6,000 fewer nurses working yeah. at the end of their tenure as government. There were 3,000 fewer uh, nurses as well working when the NDP, when they left government compared to the beginning. But, Mr. Speaker, what concerns me is in their last election platform, they committed to finding $600 million, $600 million in savings. And, in fact, the members member for Kitchener-Waterloo, when pressed on the issue by the CBC, uh, admitted the member that those from -Waterloo come in health care and in education. And when she went on to say, in fact, that she would go first to help to find that $600 million in savings, there's no doubt there would have been dramatic, drastic cuts if they had won that election, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Thank you. The question the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much. Uh, my question uh, speaker, is for the Minister of the Environment. Last week, the Minister was forced to backtrack on his negative comments towards the province's auto sector. 
Now, despite his swings at the auto sector, we know that under the government's Green Investment Fund, they're using cap and trade money to build charging stations. Now, we're glad that he saw the light on the uh, auto sector after being taken to the woodshed, Speaker. But why is he giving millions of dollars of contracts to Hydro Quebec to install electric vehicle charging stations when there are plenty of Ontario companies that can do the job? Why are you doing that, Minister? Thank you. I'm sure my colleague, Mr. Transportation, would also like to make a comment about this. But for, let's just get the record straight. I, unlike the member opposite, members over here, have voted for the largest investments in our auto sector in the history of Canada. I'm very proud to have worked with the auto sector. And, Mr. Speaker, without the support of the party opposite, who doesn't want to see any revenue come out of cap and trade for the auto sector, we're about to repeat that and make another massive investment in building the Ontario auto sector and the infrastructure to support it. I need no lessons from the member opposite on being a champion of the auto sector, and when he can hold his voting record to be anywhere near members on this side of the auto sector, because you didn't lose your, you didn't learn your lesson, and you're opposing the cap and trade system that will deliver unprecedented investments in innovation, in, in, in market development, in modernization of plants, and in developing new markets for, you. Our, for Ontario's automobile. Thank you. Let's answer the first question. Now we first we give free hydro to Quebec, and now we're going to have them build our charging stations. Speaker, the minister has to has had to backtrack on comments made about the nuclear industry, agriculture, and the auto sector all in one week. Now the minister, premier's office won't sport, even let him speak to speak the Toronto Board of Trade from because Hamilton it's too Mountain much of a liability. Order. It's one thing to say something ill-informed, but it's another to act on it. If the minister thinks it's best. To take money raised in the green money in the green investment fund, money that is raised from the taxpayer of Ontario, and invested in contracts to other jurisdictions to build charging stations. Then answer this: How much money from the green investment fund is going to contracts? I mean, money from the people of Ontario going to contracts signed with other jurisdictions. Minister of Transportation, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. of Transportation. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member of the opposition for this question, however misguided it might be. You know, Speaker, a number of weeks ago, a number of weeks ago, I was proud to stand in Mississauga here in Ontario, a wonderful community, to announce how we were proceeding with investing the $20 million uh, that we announced back in December to build, Speaker, by 2017, 500 electric vehicle charging stations across the province of Ontario. Speaker, this will no doubt lead to a reduction in what we call range anxiety for those individuals who want to make that choice and their effort collectively uh, to help us fight climate change to purchase a zero emission vehicle speaker and i would have thought i would have thought that that member and the conservative caucus would have supported an initiative that would build a network of fast and traditional chargers in every corner of the province speaker I was proud to be in Mississauga, a yes, company called KPI. We will see charging stations at Tim Hortons, at McDonald's, at Ikea's, and so many other places across this province, Speaker. This member Thank should you. support it. Thanks very much. New question, the member from Bramble, Lord Malton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today we learned that the Premier, during her first two years in office, her party held nearly 100 big-ticket fundraisers, and they promised FaceTime with cabinet ministers, raising over $20 million. A funder, fundraiser last year was hosted by the very same Bay Street insiders who will benefit from the sale of Hydro One. Also remarkable were that those donors were promised access to the ministers of both finance and energy, ministers who made the Hydro One sell-off possible. Now, Ontarians should be able to trust that the government makes decisions with respect to energy based on the best interest of the public, not the best interest of the Liberal Party or its donors. So my Deputy question House is, Leader, second time. will the government launch a public inquiry Answer into the energy sector contracts of Ontario? Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, you know, uh, as
As I have said, and as we are acting on, we're committed to uh, changing political donations in Ontario. The information that the uh, the leader or the um, member of the third party is talking about is public information, and the reporter counted the uh, events and uh, and wrote a story about it. And that's fine, Mr. Speaker. But I hope that the leader of the third party still agrees with the position that we should ban corporate and union donations. I don't know if the the leader of the third party's position has changed, Mr. Speaker, because she won't talk to us about uh, what her perspective is on uh, on the draft legislation that would come forward. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, last week the government House leader had a very productive meeting with the PC House leader and a representative of the Green Party, Mr. Speaker. And in that meeting, we provided a briefing on the draft legislation, asked for their feedback and ideas Answer. before the bill is introduced into the legislature. The only party that wasn't represented was the NDP, Mr. Uh -huh. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, Liberal donors are getting rewarded with massive private energy contracts while the people of Ontario are seeing their electricity bills skyrocket. Meanwhile, of the five OPP investigations into this government, two of them that are underway deal with Liberal employees allegedly deleting evidence which might show that the government made decisions with the energy sector that were politically motivated as opposed to in the benefit of the public. Now, Two Liberal employees have already been charged criminally. It's time to clear the air, much like in Quebec with the Charbonneau inquiry. So my question, Mr. Speaker, will the government commit to a public inquiry into the energy sector here in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. What about that Mr. Speaker, with respect to the, uh, the uh, procurement uh, uh, surrounding the IPO, uh, as the members know, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, uh, we had the Auditor General of Canada, Denny, Denny Deshotel, establish the process for procurement and assess the procurement as we went through it, Mr. Speaker. And from his report, Mr. Speaker, his final report, on the basis of the work just described, I have concluded that the process followed for the selection of the members of the IPO syndicate and for determining the structure of the syndicate was a fair process there it is. and was carried out in a fair and professional manner, Mr. Speaker. And the quote says, no conflict of interest issues None. were identified, whether in relation to members of the selection committee or members of the syndicate. And by the way, the member from Timmins, Mr. Speaker, is having a $600 dinner tonight for a small group of people raising funds for the Democratic Party. Here is, Mr. Speaker. Order. I'm uh, start the clock. I'm standing, please. I caution members about using props, and if I see it again, it'll be taken. Thank you. New question, member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for. Sorry. Seat, please. We'll try again. Member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Summer in my community of Cambridge and North Dumfries means the end of the school year, and it also means that many young people are being hired to work in summer jobs, many working for the first time. In fact, Speaker, my 19-year-old son Liam started his summer job yesterday, and I spoke to him last evening. He said that his first day included training on safety in his workplace, and he intends to do more safety training today. Recently, the Minister of Labour posted their internship blitz results on their website and have conducted vulnerable worker blitzes in the past. These blitzes show us that our government is taking action, but we know that more needs to be done. Speaker, can the minister please let this House know what he is doing to make sure people that, who are working this spring and summer know their rights and feel safe Question. when they go to work each day? Minister of Labour. 
Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for that very important question. All members of the House can play a role here. We should all be encouraging our young people to ask questions when they get their first job, to speak up when something they're asked to do perhaps feels unsafe. And we have to remind them, Speaker, that every Ontarian, regardless of their age, has a right to refuse unsafe work in this province. Speaker, it's working. Between 2000 and 2012, lost time work injuries for young people in this province decreased by 70 per cent. That's the largest decline in this country, makes Ontario one of the safest places to work in this entire country. We continue to protect our young people through blitzes, through other, other um, initiatives, Speaker, <clears throat> but we also reach out to people that are new to the province. We've got a program specifically designed for people Answer. who have joined us from Syria, Speaker, so ensuring that workers old and new know their rights is so important in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the minister for his work on this important file. So one way that I know that spring is here is the increase of construction projects throughout Cambridge and the Waterloo region. New and experienced workers participate in these projects, such as the ongoing expansion of the Cambridge Memorial Hospital in the 401 to help our cities grow and improve. I know that the minister takes health and safety very seriously, and unfortunately, we still see incidences ending in tragedy across the province. Workers continue to get injured on the job or, worse, lose their lives. In my time as an emergency room nurse, I saw too many of these types of injuries. I know that almost always these incidences could have been prevented. Health and safety training is paramount to making sure that all of our workers go home Question. at the end of each day. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House how our government is helping those who work on construction projects in the coming months? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the member for that great question. She points out, Speaker, one of the worst parts of the job of being the Minister of Labour, and that's when you get that phone call or you get that email that somebody that left for work that morning isn't going to go home to their family in that, that night, Speaker. So we need to work really hard at that. We've increased the amount of health and safety training that now is mandatory in the province of Ontario. Every single worker in this province, Speaker, has to take basic health and safety training before entering the workforce. Uh, the workforce. We've got mandatory training for those who work at heights. As of April of this year, Speaker, in one year, 100,000 people in this province have been trained to work at heights. These steps make Ontario, as I said before, one of the safest places in this country to work. We've got construction health and safety blitzes that go directly to where they need to go. Targeted inspection, Speaker. Every incident is preventable, Speaker. Let's keep working towards Thank that you. zero. And the question is the member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. As a result of changes made to the Child Care and Early Years Act, children entering the school system in September that are under the age of four will no longer be allowed to attend summer camps. This decision has taken Ontario families and summer camp operators by surprise. The Ontario Camps Association wasn't even consulted about this change, and I quote, the act was revised without the benefit of consultation or input of the OCA, its members, or the thousands of families affected. No child should be left behind simply because of their age. Children who will turn four by December 31st are allowed to register for school, but they're not allowed to attend summer camps. Minister, will you correct this error and make the entry to summer camps consistent with children entering the school system? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And, and I would like to clarify because I found that there's a lot of confusion. This is a change that was made. This is a change that was made when the Act was passed, when the Child Care and Early Years Act was passed. So it's been, no, but a lot of people think it's the regulations that uh, were just published yesterday. And in fact, it's got nothing to do with the regulations. It is, in fact, something that was passed uh, over a year and a half ago, so that in fact there has been quite a long lead time uh, before this took effect, because the actual law was passed about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, if we put this in the context of what we were trying to do with the Child Order, please. Early Years Act, one of the things that we found was Answer. that when we had 
uh, situations where children was unsafe, were unsafe, that it was typically children under school age in unlike. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. There is not a single example of a child in the OCA camp system that has been impacted under four. So please don't use a safety argument for this. Educational prof professionals, including developmental psychologists, have told me there is absolutely no science to support the minister's decision to prevent kids from attending summer camp simply because they have yet to turn four. This is yet another example of your government ignoring experts before making decisions that impact our province's families. Autism, childcare regulations, and now summer camps. Will the minister allow children turning four by December 31st to attend summer camps this year? Thank you, Minister. Well, as I said, this is a matter of law, not a matter of regulation. But if we could uh, look at the situation, the uh, if we the. Uh, the kids are not being prevented from attending camp. What the law says is that if you are going to have a group of children under the member from Dufferin Caledon come to order have a child care license because the Ontario Camp Association is not a mandatory association. It's a voluntary association. Many, many camps in Ontario are not a member of any association. There is no regulatory authority that controls camps. Answer. We want to ensure our youngest children are safe. And ensure, in order to ensure our youngest children are safe, if you are Thank going you. to have children. Um, it's, it's not helpful when I'm trying to hear an answer when people are engaging across the floor that ask the question. New question. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Tim Hortons Field in Hamilton was turned over to the city unfinished and nearly a year late last May. The construction of this stadium under the watch of the government's infrastructure Ontario turned into, unfortunately, a fiasco. Completion and handover was rushed in order to ensure the stadium be used for the Pan Am Games. Now, another year has passed, Speaker, and the stadium is still not complete. We're two years past due, and the City of Hamilton and the Ham Hamilton Tiger Cats have had enough. Both have filed notices of action in the Superior Court claiming tens of millions of dollars in damages. Wow. Speaker, enough is enough. And who did the Premier hold accountable for this two-year delay, and who will she hold accountable if the costs of this province run into the tens of millions Question. of dollars? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Finance. Sir Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. The member opposite knows all too well how important it was for us to uh, re, uh, restructure that stadium, a stadium which he was very proudly at, at the ribbon-cutting ceremonies, recognizing the outstanding support that we've done for the City of Hamilton as a result of that stadium, a stadium which will house uh, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, another great event that's coming forward, and I'm sure he'll be there for that ribbon-cutting ceremony as well. We know that Infrastructure Ontario has done many projects across the province as a lead-up to the Pan and Parapan American Games, which is a great success for our province and a great economic development, of which this one is as well. We know the legalities that are here. We also know that the job is getting done, and it will be completed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Wow. <laughs> Speaker, the City of Hamilton's claim specifies damages over construction delays, disputed contract items, non-compliance with contracts, warranty failings, and other deficiencies. Several hundred seats have obstructed views. The Tiger Cats claim that the inf Infrastructure Ontario, which is tasked by the government to arrange all privatized contracts, made negligent misrepresentations in relation to the design, construction, and completion of this stadium. Speaker, three, there's a piece to resist on. Speaker, three Pan Am executives placed third, fourth, and fifth on last year's sunshine list, collecting over $800,000 each in salaries and bonuses. Why did the Premier authorize bonuses for three Pan Am executives Question. among the highest paid on the sunshine list when claims of this magnitude were imminent against the Pan Am Thank organizing you. committee? Yay. Minister Finance. Are you 
I appreciate, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member's inference that uh, the work being done, there are some shortfalls. Infrastructure Ontario is doing what is necessary in regards to uh, perfecting the security, and that's exactly what is happening. They are getting resolutions moving forward, and we are talking about some minor amendments that are required. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, a stating of speaker. Please finish. What's important, Mr. Speaker, the stadium was ready for the games, and it's going to be ready for the Hamilton Tiger Cats as a brand new home for the champion Tiger Cats, and that's proceeding, Mr. Speaker, Answer. without delay. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Newmarket Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, through you, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. I know that the Public Lands Act is administered by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and governors, governs activities on Crown land and shorelands. Minister, there may be some confusion for waterside property owners because of an Ontario Superior Court justice uh, decision that has changed the permitting requirements under the Public Lands Act for docks and boathouses in Ontario. As a result, I understand some docks and boathouses uh, construction and rebuilding will require a permit from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry wow. in situations where a permit was not required before. Residents of my riding of Newmarket Aurora who own waterside properties want to know about the changes and why they were made before they head to their cottages this May long Question. weekend. Would the minister please explain how permit requirements have changed and what people interested in replacing, expanding, or building a new dock or boathouse should know? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, the member from Newmarket Aurora for the question. Speaker, I believe that probably uh, there's many members in the legislature that have heard about this issue in their constituency offices. Uh, if they haven't heard about it yet, I would expect they will be hearing about it soon. I've had an opportunity to talk to uh, at least three members of the, uh, the official opposition, the Conservative members. We committed in those discussions to advise them that we were working on this. There'd be more information forthcoming in the near term. Uh, yesterday, uh, my office sent out a letter to all MPPs. If you haven't received that already, uh, you should be receiving that soon. Uh, as the summer season approaches, Speaker, we believe that this issue is going to receive a higher profile in your constituency offices. This as, is as a, a result of an Ontario Superior Court of Justice decision relative to the Public Lands Act, Speaker. And in the supplemental, Answer. I'm going to provide a bit more information that may not be contained in the letter that they'll be receiving soon to try and explain a bit more detail about what we can expect. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. I understand that historically, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry permits were only required for docks and boathouses that rested on or were attached to more than 15 square metres of shorelands, usually lake beds. However, in its decision, the court held that a dock or boathouse floating above shorelands is considered to be occupying the lands beneath the structure, regardless of whether it's resting on or attached to the shorelands. I also understand, uh, Speaker, that because of this change from previous procedures, your ministry is working to simplify the process for individuals who want to build, replace, or expand docks or boathouses that are larger than 15 square metres. Would the minister explain how the ministry is working to address the issue and what individuals thinking of building, replacing, Questions. or expanding a dock or boathouse should know? Mm. Thank you. There you minister. Speaker, thank you. And again, I want to thank the uh, member from Newmarket Aurora. Speaker, again, to restate, this action is the result of a ruling from the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. Some docks and boathouses will now require permits in situations where authorization was not required before. Going forward, new docks or boathouses, seasonal docks or boathouses, and expansions to existing docks or boathouses will require a permit if they're larger than 15 square metres. Smaller docks or boathouses that occupy 15 square metres or less of shorelands do not require Public Lands Act authorizations at this time. The Speaker will continue to communicate this information as best we're able. I want to state very clearly, Speaker, that there will be no fees associated with obtaining these dock and boat 
boathouse permits. It's important that people are aware of that. Speaker, I've also directed officials to explore options Answer. to address this situation. So hopefully by the fall we will be in a position to make announcements to all of the members Thank who you. are affected by this so that in the going, uh, years going forward we won't have to. Thank you. New question the member from Lanark, 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 and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Last week during Children's Mental Health Week, the Upper Canada District School Board Director of Education, Stephen Sliwa, announced his arbitrary decision to terminate the board's long-term partnership with the Cordic Treatment Program. For 20 years, this program successfully treated and provided therapy to hundreds of children with behavioural problems graduate back into their schools. Speaker, is the minister aware that the Upper Canada District School Board is placing children with behavioural and mental issues, health issues at a significant disadvantage and making it impossible to deliver quality services obligated under the Education Act? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And, and my understanding is that uh, the facility in question is a privately operated group home. Uh, there is something, uh, as, as you would know, Speaker, under the Education Act, which we refer to as Section 23 schools, but there are teachers that are provided to go into uh, care and treatment facilities. Those could be uh, correctional facilities, hospitals, mental health facilities, which I take it is, uh, but some sort of a, of a facility where the children aren't able to leave each day. Uh, those uh, are um, an issue of the, it actually isn't the board that provides the care or the treatment. So in this case, you said a mental health. It isn't the board Answer. that provides mental health. The board simply provides uh, the teaching force and a few EAs for special education. Thank you. Supplementary. It's unfortunate, back to the Minister of Education, it's unfortunate she's not more uh, knowledgeable and briefed on uh, Section 23 programs. But unlike the callous actions of the director of the school board, I do recognize the professional staff that I've dealt with at the Ministry of Community and Social Services and Children and Youth. However, we know that the Cordic treatment program was contracted for 36 children. I understand the new service will be reduced to just 24. Also, these treatments will no longer be provided to children in grades 7 and 8. Furthermore, unlike the Cordic treatment program, the new service will not provide professional clinicians and psychiatrists to diagnose and treat the children. <coughs> Speaker, will the minister confirm that these reductions are indeed factual? And if so, why the minister is allowing the school board Question. to shirk their responsibilities and eliminate these much needed services? Thank you. Minister? Uh, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Minister of Children and Thank Youth you, Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I was actually glad to have a conversation with the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington last week about the Cordic Education Centre. As he knows, um, it's a privately operated uh, residence, but it is licensed by the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. And a number of meetings have actually taken place uh, earlier this year with the school board, with my regional staff, the local Children's Aid Society and the local mental health agency to discuss how to maintain uh, the program at least till the end of the school year and allow for a proper transition of youth. Uh, it was Children's Mental Health last week, uh, Speaker. We didn't have a huge opportunity to talk about that in the House, so I'll say now, uh, as the Minister responsible for Children's Mental Health, um, we want to make sure that the children who need mental health services Answer. get that at the right time, at the right place, in a way that suits their needs. And uh, that's why we've made substantial, substantial investments in children. Thank you. And I'll be happy to talk to the member. Thank you. New question, the member from Alberta, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, my office has been overwhelmed this spring by constituents calling, worried about potential cuts to Matthews Memorial Hospital and their emergency department located on St. Joseph Island. The possibility of reducing the current 24-hour emergency care to just 12 hours is deeply troubling to community members. I've heard from St. Joseph Island, Deborah, Bruce Mines, and along the North Shore, and other surrounding areas about how devastating this would be to our communities. 
Minister, patients and families deserve to know what's happening to our local hospital. Will the minister tell us exactly what cuts are on the table for Matthews Memorial Hospital? Thank you. Minister of Health Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I very much appreciate this question. It's uh, uh, our hospitals uh, on a regular basis as they look to uh, maintain and often improve services uh, and to provide a sustainable uh, health care environment. They look to different options and recommendations in terms of how they can modify services, but they do it. They're required to do it in a context where the, there's an expectation that the level of care is maintained or improved, that those important services to communities, particularly those that are served by Matthews, that those services are maintained. So they do this work in concert with the Lynn and the ministry as well. Any decisions, so any ideas that the administration or the board of that hospital might have, have to be then shared with the Lynn, and the Lynn shares them with the ministry so that all three Answer. parties, together with the community, are involved in, in the decisions. No decisions that I'm aware of, Mr. Speaker, have been made with regards to this particular hospital. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Funding for hospitals in Northern Ontario is, is simply inadequate, Minister. And to make matters worse, small hospitals such as Blind River Thessalon and Matthews Memorial, who join together with the goal of providing real rural patient care, do not have the funding to offer outpatient lab work. We have seen time and time again that Northern patients are taking a back seat when it comes to proper health care. Minister, why is the government refusing to deliver stable, predictable funding that hospitals need to protect patient care? for the people of Northern Ontario. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's just not true that we're not supporting and investing in our hospitals in the northern part of this province. In fact, because many of them, not all of them, but many of them are small and rural, we have a dedicated fund of $20 million annually that goes to those hospitals. We've increased, we've actually, the small rural hospitals are not part of the uh, funding reforms that we made uh, several years ago, and so they continue to be treated uh, in a separate fashion, understanding the unique challenges that they might face. But across the north, whether it's Thunder Bay Hospital or Health Sciences North or that cluster of small and rural hospitals, we make sure that we're investing in them. But importantly, I'd like to speak to the member opposite. He hasn't, to my knowledge, brought this to my attention or that of my staff or the ministry about Matthews <coughs> Hospital. Again, I would simply implore all members of this legislature, if they Answer. have a specific concern about a health care uh, uh, service in their, uh, in their riding, come to me. I'm Thank happy you. to work with them. New question, the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Oh, right. Minister, a few weeks ago, oh, wow. I was proud to join you, Tough Minister, luck, and Minister Leal at the Art Gallery of Peterborough to announce the recipients of this year's Celebrate Ontario grants. Celebrate supports local organizations by allowing festivals and events to build capacity. And I was pleased to hear that the Peterborough Music Fest received funding. This year marks the 30th year that Peterborough Music Fest has run on the picturesque shores of Little Lake. To this day, it remains a barrier-free festival with no social barriers and free attendance. Last year, Celebrate Ontario supported an increased performance schedule, which resulted in a 28% increase in tourism. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I would like the Minister to tell the members of this House more Question. about the events supported as a result of Celebrate Ontario. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for the question, and it's true. I was in Peterborough with the Minister of Agriculture at the, uh, the Art Gallery, and what a beautiful part of Ontario. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, our government Celebrate Ontario Fund supported 200 festivals and events across Ontario increasing attendance and maximizing their economic impact. A great example of this effect of the effect of Celebrate Ontario is our support uh, for the Victoria Playhouse. Last year, the funding helped the Victoria Playhouse surpass its attendance goals and attract more than 4.3 million in visitor spending for Southwest in for the Southwest Ontario region. Great event. Mr. Speaker, that's a, a story that's been repeated right across this province, from Stratford's Summer Music Festival to the Timmins Great Canadian Kayak Challenge.
Challenge and Festival to the Ottawa Blue Fest and Niagara Winter Festival of Lights. All across Answer. this great province, our government is supporting local organizations and building capacities for our festivals and events. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. It is fantastic to hear how wide-reaching and um, how successful our government's Celebrate Ontario Fund is. My writing is home to other successful festival and events, like the West Bend Arts Festival Theatre, and Cultivate, a festival of food and drink, right. along with Float Your Fanny Down the Ganny, Speaker. In all, in all 200 festivals and events received funding. Events in Northern Ontario, in rural communities, and in Southwestern, and events all along the waterfront. In Sudbury, Speaker, in Thunder Bay, Leeds Granville, and uh, Temiskaming Cochrane. The members of this House know that Celebrate Ontario is wide reaching and improves tourism. Question. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you tell the members of this House about how Celebrate supports tourism and provides platforms for Ontario? Travelers. Minister. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, I'd like to thank the member for the question. Uh, each year, Mr. Speaker, we know that our festival and events here in Ontario through the Celebrate Fund help to create jobs. In fact, since 2009, uh, we've uh, been able to create tens of thousands of jobs through this fund. And um, our target supports uh, has led to an estimated 6.2 million in additional revenue. Uh, in a, additional tourists coming back here to the province of Ontario. Tell us more. And Mr. Tell Speaker, us more. the tourism sector here in the province of Ontario is a $28 billion sector that employs over 350,000 people and many of them young people, Mr. Speaker. So we're so proud of we're so proud of tourism, we're so proud of our festivals and events and we'll continue to make that investment through our Celebrate Ontario fund so we can continue to ensure that we can tell our Answer. story, we can share our heritage and of course, Mr. Speaker, add to the economic impact here in the province of Ontario. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Oh, your question, Mayor, the member from Perry Sound, Ms. Volker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in a recent speech to the Timmins Chamber of Commerce, the CEO of Go West Gold, a junior mining company, called out your government for uncertainty in the current permitting process. No. Go West has been waiting since 2009 for all of their permits to be reviewed and either approved or denied by this government. I believe the Premier would agree that seven years is a very long time to wait for a project that will create jobs and contribute to Ontario's economy. Speaker, will the Premier explain why the permitting and approval process in Ontario is being allowed to stifle investment and preventing new mines from opening? Consumer Services. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker, and we certainly appreciate the uh, question from the member opposite. Uh, as the member knows uh, full well, Ontario is a leading jurisdiction in mining and mining development. There are uh, millions of dollars that are generated from the industry and jobs created as a result of the investments made in the uh, sector. Our ministry, uh, the Minister of uh, Northern Development and Mines, is working very hard with First Nations and uh, mining companies to ensure that the permitting process is streamlined and uh, is one that incents development and uh, supports economic growth in the province of Ontario when it comes to uh, mining. Speaker, We're pleased with the progress we've made, and we know that there's more work to do, and I know that the Minister of Northern Development and Mines is committed to doing that work. Thank you. There being no deferred vote, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.